Hello, my name's Susan Miller, and I'd like to ask you to explain how America is represented in Revelations and how you understand that America's future plays out. Say that again. I was away from this. Uh, you know, I can't hear that. I only can hear it from here. Could you explain how America is represented in Revelations and also how their future plays out in Revelations? Oh, what a good... Su was that Susie Miller? Susan Miller. Suzanne Miller. Yes. What a good question. Thank you, Susan. America in Revelation. And what is America's future? Future... Uh, like in Revelation. Uh, is America in Revelation and what is America's future Revelation? Boy, that's a good one. America is not in Revelation and our future is like everybody else in the world's future in Revelation. So let me go through that. Um, uh, we should be very cautious with, and I don't know who to use as an example, I'll use a past example, J.A. Zeiss, you know, None of you have ever heard of him, or I could go through a lot, because I have, I have 100 and, 122, I think, commentaries in Revelation. There are two ways of looking at the book of Revelation. One way is to take the book of Revelation, all the stuff there, and look out at the world and say, that must be that. Oh, that must be this. Do you remember Gorbachev? Remember Gorbachev had that birthmark or whatever it was, you know, kind of a purple spot somewhere in his head? People thought for sure that, you know, that was something prophetic, that Gorbachev was maybe something to do with, uh, he was a Russian leader, if any of you remember, back at the time, uh, I don't even know how you spell Gorbachev, so let me just uh, erase that. But, but that's an example of people taking, like, the beast, uh, uh, or 666, I actually pastored a church for many years where the entire church's goal of many of the families was that when their children were born, they hired lawyers because they would not allow their children to get a social security number. And, and it was, everyone talked about it. Every time you're around church, they were all talking about, well, I found a better lawyer and we cannot have a social security number because social security numbers are the mark of the beast. And so the, the social security number was taboo. Uh, isn't that interesting? Maybe the Antichrist will use social security numbers. I don't know. But it's not avoiding. I mean, other people wouldn't use credit cards because they said, oh, credit cards are bad. I mean, it's just like uh, there are other people that, that saw the signs of, uh, uh, of the Antichrist and everything, like the Gulf oil you know, symbol had some kind of satanic overtone to it. You know, the Starbucks, that funny mermaid thing, that's got something bad in it. And there's just people, they're trying to pick all of the, the metaphors of Revelation and tie them to something in society. And you know what? If, at, like the blood moon deal. Do you remember the blood moons, the four big blood moons we had in 2015? The people that sold gazillions of DVDs took something that, that had nothing to do with Joel or Revelation 6 and Joel 2, but they, people are so curious about Revelation that they just um, sold a lot of DVDs. Okay, so is American Revelation? No. No more than France is. No more than Japan is. Now, are there, are there geographic places in Revelation? Yes, there are. In fact, in Revelation, um, and we have two minutes, I mean, what you find is Jerusalem is the center of what's going on, and there is the King of the West, which probably is the, the beast, the Antichrist, Western Europe. There's the King of the North, and we're talking about the climactic ending of, of the battlefield is a four-part march on Jerusalem, the Kings of the South. So actually, yes, there are, and there are the Kings of the East, and, uh, and actually, China is actually, the ancient name of China is actually in the book of Isaiah. Uh, that that there, is, there is a mention of the kings of the east, which is one of the, the early titles of, of China. The kings of the north, uh, which could either be Russia, or the Soviet Union, or the stands. The kings of the south, uh, which it's fascinating how, how Israel, all of the, the descendants of Ishmael and Esau are all, you know, south in some direction from Israel. And then, of course, the Antichrist in the west. 
But back to this, and, and I think we should pick up on this. Is America's, what is America's uh, future according to Revelation? Well, what's sad is Revelation 3 tells us that the hallmark of the last days is when the church gets rich, increased with goods, and are so busy with all their trinkets that they don't have time for God. I know people that got to Star Wars hours early so they could be the first one to be in the first screening. And they stood in line for one, two plus hours. And then they sat through a 145 minute, whatever it is, I don't know how long it was, it was long, two hours plus I think. And those same people thought cover to cover or, or any Bible reading program is tedious because it takes 15 minutes a day. And yet, when it's something they love, they can stand in line for hours and sit for hours and pay $18 a ticket for you know, getting free popcorn during their movie. You want the Bible? You want to know how America is in the future? The, the worst thing for anybody is, is prosperity. For every person that, that is prosperous, the Puritans used to put it this way. They say 99 people can go through adversity and not deny their faith, but only one out of 100 can stay godly through prosperity. Now, the Puritans were really down on prosperity because they felt Revelation 3 says, when you're rich and increased in goods and don't have need of anything, you have less and less time for God and you're more distracted by everything else. So what I think is going to happen to America is, America is increasingly going to go the way we're going. Churches are going to be entertainment driven. They're going to be what we call seeker friendly, which means you don't offend anybody but God. You don't see anything that offends the people. You, you, you have diminution of the service. You make them simpler, you make them funner, you make them shorter. In fact, I've spoken at Bible conferences for 30 years. When I started out, I used to speak for one hour now, the modern ones, the cutting edge ones, are telling me, 20 minutes? Can you, can you cut them in half? People won't sit for more than 20 some minutes. I said, really? They go, mm-hmm. And they say, can you show some music videos, kind of as illustrations, because they are used to that. I go, mm. That's where we've gotten. And people wonder why they're anxious, and, and peace is distant from them, it's because America's not in Revelation because I think we're going to implode uh, for many reasons. And the future I see us is this Laodicean church that we're blind and poor and miserable and naked and, and, and far from God. And, and I think America's just losing its spirituality and they just have a form of godliness. And uh, Where is uh, America in Revelation? And that was the, the first question. Um, I would add to that, so the book of Revelation we're talking about. Is America mentioned in the book of Revelation? That's number one. But number two, uh, also, where is America just, just not even in one book, but in prophecy? And I think that's significant for us to think about and, uh, and, and to ponder how we live in an age where the Lord said the chief characteristic of the age in which we would live, in fact, it, since we're doing Q&A from the Bible, let's go to Matthew 24. Let me show you one thing. The chief characteristic of the end times, Jesus mentions over and over and over again in his longest sermon on prophecy. Remember, Jesus is the one that is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is what Jesus is all about. He is the one who wants us to know what's coming, what's happening. And so he inaugurates prophetic studies in the New Testament by Matthew 24, which is repeated in Mark 13, which is repeated uh, in an abbreviated form in chapter 21 of Luke. So all of the synoptic gospels have this, this prophetic factor. And then, of course, the Apostle John wrote 
uh, so much in the book of Revelation and 1 John about the future. But look what it says starting in verse 4. Take heed that no one what? In verse 4 of Matthew 24. No one what? Deceive you. Okay, verse 5. Many will come in my name saying I'm the Christ and will what? Deceive many. Verse 11. Many false prophets will rise up and what? Deceive many. And keep going down to verse 24. Uh, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to what? Deceive. So the the important thing to think about whenever you get into anything prophetic is that the key element of the last days is religious deception. And what Jesus said, who never uh, exaggerates and, and always speaks the truth and is truth, is that there are going to be many uh, verse 5, many are going to say, I'm coming in Christ's name. Many will say, I am the Christ. And believe it or not, people will believe him and will be deceived. So as we go into this discussion, remember we're going into a place that is fertile, that is ripe, that is filled with, I mean, just look at the internet. Just search Google for American prophecy. I mean, there's a good one. America in prophecy, and you will get an immense amount to sift through, laced with, I mean, uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. So watch out for deception, and the way that you know a deceiver is they usually have something off on the doctrine of Christ, or they're adding to the scriptures, or they're, they're inconsistent with the whole. Uh, if you remember... Last Sunday morning, uh, the, the triangle on its nose and saying that all 31,101 verses of the Bible should have weight upon any individual verse in the Bible. In other words, uh, whenever we're talking about prophecy, salvation, church polity, anything, parenting, marriage, daily life, any verse that we pick, we should find a, a analogia scriptura, a, a consistency with the whole, that God would never say anything in part that would be in disagreement with any of the other parts. See, that's the consistency of scripture, and that's the challenge, okay? So let's, let's go through uh, America in prophecy, uh, starting in Revelation. And let, let me just show you a few places that people say, and I would not agree with this, but I'll just show you what's out there. Revelation 12. So let's go there first. Uh, people see America in Revelation 12. And, and I'll, I mean, good people, uh, Christians. Uh, a lot of times, uh, people are so zealous to read the current events into the Scripture and, and uh, so Revelation 12, um, let me find it here, da, 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 13 onward. So Revelation 12, 13 onward. Uh, I'll read to you. Now, what, what we see in there is right in the middle of, of the parenthetical explanation of things that are going to happen in the future, starting in verse 13, it says, now when the dragon, uh, let's just keep the... the characters here, the dragon, which all of a sudden sounds like, you know, we're in Lord of the Rings or something, you know, or some fairy tale. Uh, the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman, the woman, who gave birth to, so the woman, who gave birth to the child. I mean, we're really already, there are so many uh, images here, so many metaphors, so many illustrations. I mean, people can go wild uh, to, the, to the child, the, which is the male child, which is Christ. But to the woman who's given two wings of a, and there it is, verse 14, eagle. What is the American symbol? The bald? There we go. So, whoop. So there's America. It's, look at that. Look what it says. 
And, and so, two wings of the eagle. I mean, probably it's the first Air Force and the second Air Force, or maybe it's a C-17, uh, whatever. And, and, and immediately, the eagle, it's America. And, and so then they, they have to make all of this be America rescuing Israel, uh, using our Air Force, or something like that. And they fly her into the wilderness. And of course it has to be us, because we have the largest Air Force in the world. You know? and, and I was telling Bonnie today, uh, if the tribulation happens anytime soon, where is America in the tribulation? We're the world's largest arms exporter. We export more military gear than all the rest of the exporters combined. We spend 80% of all the expenses on warfare in the world, our country spends it. I mean, no one in history has spent the amount of money on armaments and uh, 600 ship navy, and I mean, and we could go on and on. So immediately, the eagle becomes the USA. Now what that is, though, there, there are two ways you can look at the Bible. There is eisegesis, uh, and there is exegesis. Eis means into, ex means out of. So what that means is when you're looking at the scriptures, here is the Bible, and you can either read current events into the Bible and say, ah, USA, biggest military in the world, uh, you know, I mean, on a, we could go on, we can all brag, we do have the most amazing military accomplishments. I mean, CENTCOM, USCOM, all the com, com, coms, we have, we have headquarters for our military covering every continent of the world. Nobody can do that. I mean, we just are everywhere and spending a uh, billion dollars a month on every one of the aircraft carriers, uh, and I don't know how many of them there are, but just that alone is in excess of the military budget of even Russia. Just what we spend on our aircraft carriers is more than all of Russia spends on anything. So, I mean, it's just unbelievable. But because of America being so big, we read they, or an eisegete, an ice, which means into, it's a preposition, an eisegete reads into the Bible America. That's not proper biblical interpretation. We are supposed to be exegetical, that you let the Bible speak outward and explain itself. And so what is the eagle? I mean, this is just a good, fun Bible study. Do y'all remember uh, the Exodus? Let's go back to Exodus chapter 19. I'll just show you. I mean, this is a simple one. This is one, that, the first lesson you have to take in, in hermeneutics uh, and eschatology and seminary. But look at Exodus 19, and let's discover who is the, the eagle. And uh, the Lord says um, in chapter 19, uh, third month, they came out of Egypt, verse 1. They departed Rephidim, verse 2. Moses went up to God, verse 3. And the Lord starts talking in verse 3. So God is talking, verse 3, of Exodus 19. Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, you have seen, verse 4, what I did to the Egyptians and how I... What does your Bible say? Bore you on what? Oh, there's America again, right? <laughs> I think that we helped the Jews get out of captivity in Egypt because it's on what? Eagle's wings. Now see, and, and we could go to uh, 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 further on in, in uh, Deuteronomy 32. It's, it's a very similar uh, idea, but but basically this: if the Bible, if the the analogia, if the scriptures explain the scriptures, uh, then what will happen is that any of these biblical allusions or metaphors or symbols that are in the Bible, another part of the Bible will explain them, rather than us having to go out like one um, industrious uh, prophetic online place does, and they say, well, the 42 months of Revelation means that in 1798, 
something happened in Europe, and it lasted until, and, and they just, they start calculating how many months, and they, they try and read from events in history in and try and make it fit with the Bible. So what I'm saying is, uh, Revelation 12, is, the eagle is God. God is one that rescues them. So that is not uh, to be thought of as America. Here's another one that is not America. Look at chapter 18. Um, Revelation 18 uh, is uh, Mystery Babylon. Babylon the Great. And chapter 18 talks about this, this uh, amazing commercial materialistic something called Babylon. And all of Revelation 18 is about this Babylon. Now remember, Babylon is a city. It's still there. You know, it's in Iraq. It's also the first empire. Uh, when God, God who knows the end from the beginning, who sees everything at once, God says that in the history of the world, there are only going to be, and he already knows how it ends, by the way, there only are going to be four empires. Did you know that? And America is not one of them. And neither is Russia. Neither is China. Neither is Great Britain. You understand? We already know the empires of the world. God has already said in Daniel 2 that until his kingdom is established and destroys man's kingdoms, there will be four. And they are Babylon, and then the Medo-Persian, and then the Greek, and then the Roman. I mean, that's, that is in the scriptures, clear as day. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, repeated. So Babylon was the first empire. So it's just not just a city, it was an empire. You know, Nebuchadnezzar and, and Shadrach, Meshach, and to bed we go. That's what I used to think it was. My parents would always say, let's have the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and I always thought when I was little that meant to bed we go because, you know, we always went to bed after the Bible story. But no, it's Abednego. But you remember Daniel and the lion's den. That's Babylon. That's, that's an empire. That was the first of the four empires and this encompasses all of human history. And so is America in prophecy? And I'll come back to that because this is very interesting, the Roman Empire and what's happened to it. But is Revelation 18 equal America? In the sense, is America Babylon? No. But does America appear this and act this way? It certainly does. Uh, we probably, look at verse 3, for the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the kings of the earth committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. The United States, our equity markets, our derivatives, our everything, no nation in the history of the world has been as wealthy as we are. Now it's electronic wealth and it's paper wealth and it's not, based on a lot of stuff, but it sure is great, and it's working right now, and we're experiencing a standard of living no one had. I just read a piece in, um, um, I don't know where, the Wall Street or, or New York Times, that talked about what a typical person living in an apartment. You walk in your apartment, and a light goes on. You flip a light. You walk to the sink, you turn your, your, your faucet, and warm and cold water, even hot water, comes out. You turn another one, and poof, gas, which is only 219 a cubic foot, which is really low. And can you imagine, it's, it's, we have such commodities available to us coming right into our apartment. And it took just what is in a normal one-bedroom apartment, and this article counted how many workers it would take to go out in the woods and cut down a tree and split it and, and build a fire and warm the water that was carried from either a well or a river or somewhere else 
and the ones to keep the fire going and to pour the water into the pot to warm it up and then to carry it into your house when you wanted warm water and then to, you know, get rid of the ashes and keep cutting more wood. But that's just the ones that were doing the warm water. We're talking about hot water at any instant in your house. Now we're, that's just the water. What about the air, the heat that's going through? What about the lights? And, and it talked about how many people you would have to have working for you uh, all the time to just be the conveniences that a normal four or $500 a month apartment or 600 whatever they are, costs. And then you talk about our food. Wow. To be able to have fresh beef, You've got to have people out guarding those cows. You have to have more that are leading them and regularly butchering them, but you don't want it to spoil. And for you to have friends. And so what I'm saying is, we live in a time right now, normal apartment dwellers are living better than kings and queens lived in centuries back. They did not have central heating. They did not have central anything. Uh, they had people that was move, were moving everything in and out and the food and, and everything. So look at what it says. The merchants were rich through the abundance, verse 3, of our luxury. And then it starts talking about all the luxuries that's going on. And so basically, Revelation 18 and Mystery Babylon is not America. And again, I could take you back uh, to the Old Testament, to the Minor Prophets, where it talks about Babylon and the storks, and the lead tablets, and the basket, and the, you know, the, the basket the storks bring with the lid on it, and they take it off, and all, what is all that? It's talking about this, this whole idea of commercialism, of materialism, of wanting all these slaves, of all these conveniences, and then look at the luxuries that most people never had in their life. Uh, the merchants, verse 11, weep over her. What, what are the What's the characteristic of the tribulation time? There are people that are buying and selling and enjoying gold, verse 12, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory. Wow. You know, I thought that that was protected. It's not if you're wealthy. I mean, the, the whole smugglers, poachers thing. If you have enough money, in some countries, I know not in America because we have all the, the border, you know, uh, watching for what's being brought into our country, but the wealthy people of the less civilized in America countries, if you want ivory, you can have ivory. Uh, just go kill some more elephants and leave them, take their tusk off of them. But look, even in the tribulation, people are getting objects of ivory, every kind of object of precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon and incense, and you can read the list for yourself. The fruit that your soul longed for is gone from you, and the things from which you had were, that were rich. So Revelation 8 is about materialism. Materialism, commercialism, uh, living for the world, is basically uh, something that, that became, remember what Babylon was in Daniel's image? Do you all remember? Say yes or no. The head of gold, yeah, yes, some of you know. Some of you remember that from Sunday school. Go back to Daniel chapter two, and you remember this, this statue, the first empire was the wealthiest, uh, Babylon, Daniel chapter two, and you notice that, that God talks about them, the head of gold, and then the, the chest and, and uh, uh, basically uh, the thorax here of silver, and then the bronze, and then the iron. Basically, the material gets less precious in each empire. The, the, it goes from gold to silver, and of course silver is great, but gold is better. And, and silver's great, or I mean bronze is great, but silver is better than bronze as far as in value. And iron, you know, is cheap, and bronze is a little more, and silver's more, and gold's more. But gold, you know, you can bite it. You know, remember the westerns where you bite it? It's so soft you can actually sink your teeth into it. You can't do that with silver. You break your teeth with uh, bronze, and, you know, iron crushes stuff. And so there's an increasing strength of the empires and a decreasing wealth. And the Babylonian commercialism, the first empire, was fabulously wealthy, the head of gold. And so 
this is not American, I could go on and on, but, but watch out for people that say that America is in Revelation 12, America is not the eagle. God is the eagle. America is not Mystery Babylon. We're very infected by it, we're very materialistic, we're very commercial, uh, but it's not there. Now, where is America? Well, let's go back to Ezekiel, because uh, you're in Daniel. Back up to Ezekiel. I want to show you something. Two verses. Um, in Ezekiel 39. Because this is interesting. And I, if, if, uh, if we were having a, a question and answer that was just yes or no, and someone said, is America in prophecy? I'd say no. So, that's the answer, but I'm going on and on. But this is interesting, and this is historic, and I, this is something that Bible scholars and prophecy scholars have talked about. Uh, it's Ezekiel 39, and it's verse 6. And, uh, and you know what 39 is about. Behold, I'm against you, verse 1, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And even a rudimentary search of those would, would give you a geographic area that is far north of Israel and that is historically the home of the Scythians. Scythians. Must have not paid enough rent on this thing. It doesn't like uh, Scythians. S-C-Y-T-H-I-A-N-S. The Scythians were a group of nomadic, fierce, horse-riding, arrow shooting, dagger toting, horrific pillaging conquering people that lived in the steppes of Russia. Steppes with two Ps. You know, the, if you know the, the plains, the grass plains that go up, going up into Central and Northern Asia, those are called the steppes. And these Scythians were feared because of their ability to ride a horse holding on with their knees and to turn all the way around and shoot an arrow while the horse is galloping they could hold on and they could turn around and they could shoot their they would get people to pursue them and then they would kill them and then they would they did a lot of horrible stuff they'd cut their heads off uh, crack the skulls in half like a coconut and use them as their dishes they, they ate and drank out of skulls and uh, were just there, and they did all kinds of stuff. They were kind of like um, uh, very, kind of like modern ISIS brutality is what they were like. But the Scythians lived in the steppes going up toward Russia, and you say, so what? What does that mean today? If you go to the Kremlin, now that should ring a bell, the Kremlin, that's kind of the, uh, you know, Washington, D.C., Smithsonian, National Mall area of Russia, the Kremlin. They have their big museums and the Orthodox Church and, of course, the head of their military there. Did you know the first museum you go to, the Smithsonian of Moscow? The front? I know, because I go there. I mean, I used to teach in Russia, and I, we would always get off and get off the train and go through the Kremlin and see everything. And I remember the first time I stumbled in, and I went, What? Scythians? You're proud of them? They're proud of their heritage. Those were conquering people that conquered all the way down. The furthest south they went is they conquered a town five miles south of the Sea of Galilee in Israel. And it's called, it was called up until the 8th century, Scythopolis, the city of the Siths. The Scythians. So who claims them? Russia. So no matter what anybody says, oh, Russia is not in the Bible, mm, the Scythians are. I mean, they're named. And they lived, look what 39 says, they lived in the, the land of Meshach and Tubal, and they live, verse 2, in the far north, uh, and they come against, God says, God says they, the Scythians from the steppes that founded Scythopolis in Israel 
and are featured in the Kremlin in Russia to this day are going to look at verse 3 they're going to come from the far north against the mountains of Israel and they're going to attack Israel and be defeated that's interesting and that nobody asked me about that so I'm not going to talk about that but here's the interesting thing verse 6 have you been looking at this this is one of the places that some very reputable people see Israel and prof or I mean American prophecy and it says and I will send fire on Magog and on those who live look at this in security in the coastlands and then they shall know that I am the Lord and what they say some that the people who live in the coastlands securely is us if you think about it we've been insulated remember uh, all the hundred years war in, in, in Europe we didn't have any problem with that the 30 years war we didn't have problem with that we had our own little civil war which killed half a million of us but we basically only went into World War I because we wanted to and only went into World War II because we wanted to because we were attacked but basically this country has thrived in every way because we have an ocean on both sides and until missiles and airplanes it was very hard to do anything to us we were very secure in our coastlands and so that is one place that uh, uh, some prophetic people so I would say that the reason America might not be in end day prophecies is because fire when when Russia attacks Israel it says simultaneous with that that fire hits the people living securely in the coastlands uh, that I mean for those who have trouble sleeping at night that would be a thermonuclear exchange and you say oh but our military is too too good for anything like that to happen to us yeah it is too good but we're entirely dependent on technology it's the only thing about Russian military equipment is you can run it through the mud and throw sand in it and dump a bucket of water and it still runs in America if it's not you know in white glove pristine condition it's so high-tech that it can bog down China last week launched a satellite killer and they now have a movable they can start knocking out satellites we have about 400 military satellites that are watching everybody breathing all over the world China can now systematically wipe them out Russia is developing the same thing the only edge we have is electronic and high-tech and if you knock that out they certainly I mean America we, I don't even know if we have any 50 megaton bombs they have I mean Russia is big we're precise and what they do I mean America has these ICBMs they have all these little bomblets in them and they will only hit right there and Russia just puts one out and it does everything and that's just brute force so for those that are loving you know can't sleep at night they say that America gets wiped out in verse 6 of chapter 39 but uh, that you know is possible or not possible we aren't mentioned in the future but let's look at Ezekiel 38 because there is one more uh, and then um, maybe we will have time for for more quite well I do want to show you one more thing in Revelation but look at Ezekiel 38 13 because this is another error um, there are two parts this error uh, in Ezekiel 38 it says Sheba Didan now if you know anything about those are the descendants of Abraham Abraham had many more children than this Ishmael and Isaac and if you read uh, you know Abraham lived on after his beloved uh, uh, wife died and he married more and begat children and they became the people of the East and a lot of these descendants uh, of his are the desert nomadic people not just the Ishmaelites uh, that that came through his son Ishmael but also the the other descendants that that came through his other wives but that's that's all just uh, normal but look at the end of, or the middle of verse 13 the merchants of Tarshish now this is where in the old days 
people would interpret Tarshish as equaling Britain. And so Tarshish is Britain. You say, so? And so the merchants of Tarshish and all their, and the New King James says, young lions, or merchants is a, a variant of that. So Tarshish is merchants or young lions or uh, descendants from Tarshish. So what they're saying is the American colonies, you know, the 13 colonies, are the young lions of uh, Tarshish. Well, the problem is in, in the Bible, most likely Tarshish is Spain. Um, when Paul wanted to go to Tarshish and went on his missionary journeys, it, most of the Bible scholars of the Pauline life says that he went down into Spain. And, and so it's very hard to equate Tarshish as Britain and then the 13 colonies. That's one error. So I would say don't see the U.S. in Ezekiel 38. Don't see the U.S. in Revelation 12, the eagle. Don't see the U.S. in Revelation 18. Uh, that's not, that's, that's eisegesis. That's reading into the scriptures. That's not letting the scriptures speak out. So uh, where is the U.S. Um, in Revelation? Well, in Revelation 2 and 3, we see the condition of the churches. And the condition of the churches, uh, if you remember, Ephesus was distracted. Uh, they, they left their first love, so they're distracted. And uh, the, the Lord is displeased with them. And I would say that's, uh, that's a good description of much of what's going on in America. So many churches are distracted. Did you know we don't even need this building? We certainly don't need uh, millions and millions of dollars of equipment. We're supposed to be, all of us are supposed to be reaching individuals for Christ. Sometimes the, all of the other stuff, I mean this is a tame church compared to many. Churches have bowling alleys and juice bars and, and uh, you know, um, Zumba. You know, everybody has to be in shape, you know. And, and in California, I mean, it's all health stuff. And, and, and I mean, it's just unbelievable what the church has gotten into and has been distracted from going into all the world and making disciples. And all you need to do to make a disciple is know Jesus Christ and explain to someone about him. And Ephesus was distracted, and Smyrna, if you remember, was suffering. And Pergamus was totally compromised and married to the world. I mean, they were so worldly uh, that, that it was like they were married to the world. And by the time we get to Sardis, do you remember what the Lord said about them? You are dead. You don't even have a pulse spiritually. And Thyatira, uh, were, were involved in terrible sins, and not until we get to Philadelphia, so there's a Thyatira, Philadelphia was actually the only church that was doing what they were supposed to do. And they were going into all the world making disciples, and there's no condemnation for the Philadelphian church. And then Laodicea, if you remember them, are rich and increased with goods and don't need anything, which is so parallel to Ephesus. So I see America not in prophecy, uh, because probably uh, all of our excessive debt that we have built up, remember Proverbs says debt is going to make you become a servant to someone who you owe the money to, you have to serve them. We owe money to everybody, to the world. We, owe, we have more debt in America than, than all the other nations put together. Our are trillions and trillions and trillions, and if you add to it the promises we've made, it's, we could buy the whole world. And so it's possible that America will economically implode or collapse. Um, that's very possible. And, uh, uh, or, I mean, there's really three things could happen to America, the economic collapse, uh, or the kind of like a civil war, you know, uh, that I mean, look what's going on right now. Are you watching the news, how they've taken over a federal building somewhere, over a ranch somewhere, and all the militias are getting involved? 
Or, here's a good one, at the rapture, uh, there are so many believers, there are more believers in America uh, that, that are all over the place in key positions. And if they were removed, it, it would affect this country, which is kind of like the Left Behind Tim LaHaye series. So economic collapse, civil war, rapture, or worse. Um, or worse, you know, here. Uh, wherever it went, uh, Ezekiel 39. So that's probably why America's not listed. But all the characteristics, now if you want to go to one more, and then we're going to have to meet our new members and save your questions for next week because you shouldn't ask long questions if you don't want a long answer. <laughs> but uh, look at Revelation um, 9 and 16. Those will be my last two. Um, in chapter 9 of Revelation, this is where America is going fast. Revelation 9, verse 20. And the rest of mankind were not killed by the plagues, did not repent, Revelation 9, 20, of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons. You say, people don't worship demons. Really? Many of our video games, the, the monster ones, actually use biblical names for demons in them. I mean, Apollyon is a Bib the destroyer. Those are actual named demons. And, and there, there is such a demonic hold in America. There's such a desire for the paranormal. And you add to that all the Eastern religion. Yoga is not neutral. That's kind of like saying a neutral Quran. You know, yoga is not neutral. It's an Eastern opening of the mind. It, it's teaching you to let go and open your mind. Minds are the conduit to the spiritual world. It would be like living in the swamp ridden with malaria and opening the screens and just saying, let's just see what comes in. If you open your mind, Satan wants to come. He wants to control people. And, and to take the primary Eastern ways of India, the fountain of all this religious confusion, and to import it to America as a health benefit for our stressed out society, and teach people to meditate and open their minds, it's opening our minds down the line to demons. They should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone, which cannot see. And look at verse 21, that's even more blatant and would not repent of their murders. I mean, murder is so rampant in our country. There's so many parts of our country you don't, you know, you have to be careful, not just America. There's sorceries. That actually, that's the word uh, pharmakeia. Pharm sounds like pharmacy, doesn't it? Pharmakeia. Uh, that, the farm part, is drugs. I mean, who's the biggest consumer of drugs in the world? They wouldn't repent of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality. Who is the largest exporter of pornography in the world? America. We are. We might not be the biggest consumer. There are countries that outdo us in the consumption per capita but we export it for profit or of their thefts. So Revelation 9, uh, America is headed toward disaster. Uh, any nation that, that, that denies uh, the creator and the, crea the creation that he created, that he is the author of that, that denies the, the judge and the ultimate responsibility and will not, we can't even publicly, as a nation, talk about our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. I mean, he's taboo. Uh, this is the first Christmas that's a non-Christmas. That was in the New York Times. It says the, non, the first non-Christmas. You don't even call it Christmas anymore, anywhere, that has anything to do with public correctness. So right there, and then finally look at chapter 14, and then I have one minute, chapter 14 
of Revelation, which is another uh, sighting. And the angel came, uh, let's see, verse 6, an angel flew from heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, saying, fear God, verse 7, give glory to him. And the, the, the descriptor for who God is is, who made heaven and earth and the seas and the springs of water. And this is the last thing. If you, if you want to be confused, rob a person of their origin. Don't let them know where they came from. Rob them of their destiny, where they're headed. And don't give them any purpose in life. And our Creator gives us our origin, our Redeemer, we were bought at a price, and we have a purpose to live, and it fills our lives. And he is the judge. And he is the one that's already told us in Revelation the destiny of this world. And every, every creature in the sea is going to die, and the sun's going to flare out, and stuff's going to start raining to earth, and God's going to unlock the demon hordes, and we know what's coming, and we know where we came from. Well, no one believes in creationism anymore. You certainly can't talk about Jesus Christ. And don't be judgmental. And so people have no idea where they came from. They have no idea why they're here because they evolved and they don't know what. And they have no idea where they're going. And America uh, is past hope as far as, as being a Christian. We never were a Christian nation. But what we're supposed to do is still go into all the world and lead individuals to Christ. I don't ever think we're going to have a national revival. I wouldn't, I wouldn't lay awake at night hoping for it. But we can have local, personal pockets and lead people to Christ.